What we need to know is, are you in all the way? Let's get to it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Decoding TV, a podcast about television. I am David Chen. And I'm Patrick Willems. Welcome to the podcast. On today's episode of Decoding TV, we are going to be discussing season one, episode four of Andor, which is currently streaming right now on Disney+. Plus. Patrick Willems, before we get into today's episode, mm-hmm. got a lot of feedback in response to last week's episode, a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of people saying, glad Patrick Willems is aboard this podcast, really psyched about that. So thanks to everyone for your feedback. Now, you can always write into us at decodingtv at gmail.com, find more episodes of this podcast at podcast.decodingtv.com. Uh, but there's many ways you can get in touch with us. Uh, you can comment on YouTube, as an example, at youtube.com slash decodingtv. We've got a few comments that I wanted to mention. Uh, I, I don't remember where this comment came from, but last week I quipped that uh, we had no confirmation that the opening scene took place at a space brothel. Maybe it could have been at a, a space video game arcade. Um, but I think somebody pointed out, I don't remember where we got this comment, but on Twitter or somewhere else, that uh, in the report, like in the scene on Morlana 1 corporate headquarters, uh, Karn's superior did say that it was a uh, space brothel. So. I guess our innocence is lost. I just so so what it. we're saying is Patrick was right. Yes. You, you, were, you called that one. You called that one. So Thank you. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I, it was, I was joking around anyway. It was very clearly a space brothel. <laughs> and, uh, and we have important, we had confirmation last week, yes. And the important thing is it means we are in dark adult new territory mm-hmm. in this galaxy far, far away. Indeed. Julian writes on YouTube... Great discussion. Enjoy having Patrick as a co-host. Me too, Julian. I think the reference to Clem Andor being executed is actually in episode three. Luthen says to Cassian something along the lines of, isn't that the square where they hung your father? Which causes Cassian to become paranoid. So yeah, it seems like Clem was Andor's adopted father and he was publicly executed, end quote. Wanted to make that clear. Uh, Clem was the adopted father. And yeah, it seems like he met a challenging and terrible end. Uh, Thank you for the uh, factual update, Julian. Um, Another factual update comes from Matt commenting on YouTube. I think the downed mining ship is from the pre-Empire Republic. Uh, Marva specifically says Republic Cruiser is on the way. So this is probably right before the fall of the Republic. Now, this is in reference to the scene from episode three of Andor, where Marva is about to get going. Andor is there in the ship with her. And she says, there's a cruiser on the way. I accidentally said Empire Cruiser, but in fact, it was a Republic Cruiser. Uh, so good call out, Matt, uh, but Patrick Willems, perhaps you could help me to understand and reiterate for our listeners, right? The Republic is the thing that came before the empire. The empire is what we saw in episode four of star Wars. We are, I think in the Republic days right now, but like, where are we in the timeline? What is the difference between the Republic and the empire? Okay. So in star Wars episode three, revenge of the Sith, uh, that is the movie where, you know, as you know, I, I assume everyone listening has probably seen that movie before near the end of that movie, uh, Emperor Palpatine makes a big, well, I guess, uh, Chancellor Palpatine at the time makes a big speech to the Senate and basically says that the, the Republic will now become a grand empire of the galaxy. And basically, yeah, so it, it's, it's in that movie after he has you know, issued Order 66 and wiped out the Jedi, who he claimed were trying to stage a coup. Uh, So yeah, it's in episode three that the Empire officially begins. So everything from that point forward, it is the Galactic Empire, which means that that whole flashback, uh, you know, that to Canari, when Cassian is like a teen or whatever, that is probably taking place like... Honestly, like during the Clone Wars. Yeah, I was going to say probably. during like episode two of Attack of the Clones, probably. So yeah, uh, so that was during the Republic. But as of Andor, are we in the Empire timeline? Do you think? Oh, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Like, we're, if we're, anyone says the word Imperial, yes, then we're in Empire times. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Got it. I mean, ev- here's the thing: anything set after Revenge of the Sith, it is the Empire. Yeah. Yeah. It just. It just. This is set before Rogue One, so that's why I was like. Right. So oh, Rogue it, One takes place before episode four, after episode three or during episode three time frame, I guess. Uh, it, actually, no, it had to be after episode three because Darth Vader oh, shows up in Rogue One. Yeah, it's way after. Years after. Yeah, decades yeah. after. Yeah. Decades uh, after. Yeah. I mean, the Obi-Wan Kenobi show is the only, it, it is the, 
the only one that's like set like a decent amount earlier that's yeah. set may, maybe that's set like 10 years or so before because like rogue one okay timeline stuff yeah rogue one takes place oh like um basically right before episode four so literally it's, days yeah. before <laughs> right so I, I, it's like, like the same time period as episode four basically yeah. exactly and then and this takes place five years before episode four i see and A- and or does you're saying and or does. Yeah, okay. And then the Obi-Wan Kenobi show, I believe, takes place probably about five years before and or. I think about 10 years pre-episode four. Got it. I, there's, I'm, there's about a 20-year gap between episodes three and four. Got it. Okay. Because Luke Skywalker has to go from a newborn baby <laughs> to being Mark Hamill's age. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. All you wanted to know about the timeline of Star Wars, uh, but yeah, there's this kind of middle period between episodes three and four. Rogue One happens, Andor happens, Obi Wan happens. Like this is kind of in that period, but it and, is the Galactic Empire at this point. So yes, and I w- I will say for anyone who wants a very very detailed uh, Star Wars timeline, uh, my friends Alex and Molly who run the Star Wars Explained YouTube channel, which is uh, a Great channel and an incredible resource. They know more about Star Wars than literally anybody I know. Uh, they, I believe, annually make a new video that gives you the entire chronology of all of Star Wars. And so that will answer any questions that we don't have. Awesome. Uh, well, I'll try to link to that in the show notes, Patrick. Uh, okay. Uh, somebody DM'd me on Instagram, at Dave Chensky, to express their fandom for the podcast. Uh, but they also said, quote, I have some thoughts on Deputy Inspector Karn that I hope will add some dimension to his character. By way of background, I retired from law enforcement with almost 25 years of experience, two local and 22 federal, and also spent several years as an Air Force officer. Anyone who has worked in law enforcement recognizes Karn. He is what we would call badge heavy. They are overly aggressive, escalate situations, and use their badge and uniform to establish their status. In Karn's case, there would also be some idealism mixed in there. A true believer who's bought into the fascism of law and order espoused by the Empire. He also reminds me of new military officers straight out of college who, because of their rank, are thrust into positions of authority with limited or no practical experience. End quote. Anyway, I just appreciated that perspective from somebody who's been in uh, law enforcement and the term badge heavy, I thought was like a very good way of describing Karn, you know? That that all checks out. Yeah. YouTube comments, decoding gmail.com. Instagram DMs, however you want to send it in, uh, we'll talk about it on the show. We're easy to reach. Indeed. We're very public people. We're extremely online. Okay, Patrick Willems, let's talk about episode four. Let's do it. What'd you think? Overall thoughts? Uh, I, d- I really dug it. Yeah? I'm, I'm pro episode four. <laughs> I enjoyed episode four of Andor. I thought that it's clearly a like setup episode. You know, it's clearly like, I mean, I mean, basically like episode one was. Yeah, I mean, but even more acutely because it's basically setting up a heist. It'd be like watching the setup exposition part of the heist, and you don't actually see the heist itself. It's like right. So you're you're just seeing the first part of it. I am really hoping we're going to see the actual heist itself next episode because otherwise, uh, that's really gonna, you know, it's gonna give me a lot of anxiety to not see it. If I had to guess, I would say this is the setup for the heist. The following episode will have said heist. Yeah. And then the third episode, because remember, the the season is structured. kind of three episode chunks, kind of, right? Exactly. Three episode arcs, and uh, which I I really like the idea of. Yeah. And it seems like, for instance, this episode written by Dan Gilroy, brother of Tony, writer-director of movies like Nightcrawler, Mm -hmm. um, it seems like, like, my guess is he's probably going to write this set and then yeah and then Susanna white the director of this one will probably direct the next two yeah and it's so cool it's such a cool idea of basically you're getting like people to like write and direct like these basically mini movies right oh and then i was just gonna say i assume the third episode will probably be then like the fallout of the heist because based on my experience with heists in (laughs) in fiction they rarely go exactly as planned Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think that's probably true yeah. Okay. So a lot of the, this episode is set up. I do wish you know they release these episodes three at a time so we could watch them like you know as their own self contained movie. But it's so cool that they're getting all these auteurs to to basically like make Star Wars stuff. It's it's a, this is a great time to a be watching this show, be a Star Wars fan, b having a podcast talking about it. Right. So like mm-hmm. I'm really I'm really excited about that. What I was impressed by with the episode, there's two things that stick out to me about this episode. One is uh, that. Even though it's mostly set up, 
we still got to have like a lot of great character moments, specifically when it comes to Vel, this person who's leading this group of people. Uh, and just you really get a sense that she's trying to assert herself, be the leader, but like at, you get the sense that like at any moment this could go badly for her. Like people could just turn on her. It's just like things just go a little bit south. If Cassian's behaving a little bit dodgy, like it just could all go south. And um, and that's a great kind of tension to have in an episode. And also, I mean, it, it, yeah. it's like not 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 to interrupt, but it's the same kind of thing that we were talking about in our previous episode about you know all the characters we meet clearly we're showing up and they they like they all have a lot going on they have like this that like this complex interior life a lot of problems they're dealing with and uh and right like we meet vel and sudden and like obviously she has like a ton on her plate and like cassian is just another thing she has to deal with yeah yeah and i i also just like that we get to see vel in different contexts like you, you see her talking to Luthen and then she behaves one way to Luthen. And then you see her talking to Andor and she behaves one way to Andor. And she's like, hey, and by the way, we will never tell anyone in the actual group that we had this conversation, you know? And mm -hmm. and so she needs to like represent herself in different ways to different people. And this is like such a great way of getting to learn a character is you see them behave really differently in different contexts in the course of like a 45 minute episode. Um, yeah. So it's a really cool way to learn about her. The other thing, of course, is just that uh, <laughs> what's amazing about this show is, you know, whenever you see a major battle happen or something happen in, in Star Wars, what you don't see is all the paperwork that needs to be done afterwards. <laughs> and This is what we've wanted for years. <laughs> George Lucas never gave us the paperwork. Yes. And that's what this is about. It's about these mid-level bureaucrats navigating what happens after an event like the Ferrix disaster from last episode. And it's like, okay, I don't know where this is going to go. Like, I don't know if this is going to lead to somewhere interesting, but what I like about it is how accurate it feels. I have been in large corporate environments for a lot of my adult life. And what is a pervasive sense you get when you're in those environments and that, that you get when you're watching this episode is there's always somebody else that you need to please, right? And it's like, okay, in this episode, we are introduced to Blevins, who is, uh, I, I works for the Empire and kind of has power over Karn and his compadres. Um, but then we also meet Blevins' boss and his coworkers, right? And it's like, okay, as much as Cyril Karn pissed off his, his coworkers, like, now Blevins needs to deal with that. And then like his boss played by Anton Lesser, uh, AKA Maester Kyburn from Game of Thrones. He, he probably has some stuff. He, he needs to report to his boss as well. And everyone is just trying to represent their work in the best way. And it just feels like, wow, they're really capturing office dynamics, but in a Star Wars setting in a way that I don't think I've ever seen before. And that's just very exciting. Uh, as somebody who wants to see this kind of nuance and complexity and honestly stuff that is relevant to our world, like stuff that is relevant to like what you and I might go through in our daily lives. So anyway. Oh yeah. I, I totally agree. It's, it's one of these things where it feels funny when talking about star Wars, a, uh, a franchise whose core appeal has always been its sense of escapism and adventure and seeing <laughs> spectacular new things, people with laser swords and spaceships. And I'm here going, man, I love that they finally gave us bureaucrats in offices doing paperwork <laughs> and talking about quarterly reports and, uh, <laughs> you know, meeting quotas and stuff like that. But the thing is, because I was like, I think like part of the ongoing appeal of Star Wars is that we were, of course, all initially sucked in by the amazing, fantastical world and all just all the cool stuff everywhere. And uh, and and just that it, it being a fast paced adventure story with spectacular visuals. Um, but what George Lucas built was this this massive complex world where we we want to know everything about it and how everything works you know 
the example everyone has always pointed to is like, oh, you look at the cantina scene you, and you go, I want to know the stories about every single person there. And here, what's exciting to me is that it is really fleshing out this world by showing like, oh, we know the empire, but we usually, our experience with the empire is just like, oh, the emperor himself are just like the top generals in the middle of like space battles and that kind of thing. But this is a massive organization. This is basically just a government. And I've always been kind of curious, yeah, what's the rest of the government like? What is it what what's like what is life like for the mid-level people who just uh who are in char- you know, this is the kind of thing it's like I mean <laughs> Because those people are honestly more relatable, you know, I, I would is. argue. Yeah. But like, this is the kind of thing that goes all the way back to like the, the scene in Kevin Smith's Clerks with people <laughs> discussing like the uh, the construction workers and contractors yes. who were working on the Death Star and who probably got killed. Like, this is what nerds talk have talked about for years. It's like, what about all the other people there? And what, what I'm enjoying so much with Andor is that it is actually showing us all those people, the people lower down that we never usually see but also those people still have like genuine drama going on there is like workplace conflict and like real stuff they're dealing with and they're all complicated interesting people because in this episode we meet so many new characters like this is very much a start of a new arc because like a few characters from the last episode carry over but the majority of the cast here is people we're meeting for the first time. Yeah, it's a ton of people. It's probably like half a dozen, a dozen new characters. So yeah. Uh, well, let's get into what actually happens in the episode. The episode opens with Luthen and Andor on the ship escaping, and they have uh, another conversation about what it is that Luthen actually wants. I-, I think this is a necessary conversation because their conversation was so short on the on the planet, and it's like, okay, it, it, it's not just like Andor is going to be like, okay, let's go. I'm going to do whatever you want because uh, Andor really only just stuck with Luthen out of self-preservation last episode, right? So yeah. he needs some convincing. And there's some nice, really nice, nice moments in this conversation. Uh, at one point, he says that he was in a prison camp. I couldn't hear exactly what it was called, Minmud or something like that, when he was 16 years old. And he says he, he's one of 50 that, people that survived and that the Empire made them like fight each other, right? I, I was also trying to catch this, yeah. yeah. And the idea is that the Empire has been a an oppressive force for Cassian Andor for his entire life, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, Skarsgård is, knows a lot about Andor's life. Like Andor tries to represent how you like, you know, I fought in this place and this, and he's like, actually you were a cook there. And uh, he calls Andor out on his BS. Uh, so he like, he's like studied Andor for a, a long time. He didn't just show up and was like, this guy might be good to recruit. Uh, and he kind of makes a pitch like, Hey, rather than you're going to die fighting these people, rather than just kind of doing things here and there, not really having a plan. Why not commit yourself to this cause uh, and we can really do something to t- take a chunk out of these folks in a meaningful way. Um, similar to the speech that he gave in last episode, right? It and also another him. excuse for uh, Stellan Skarsgård to say, bastards. Yeah. <laughs> which seems to be his favorite word. It reminds me of Josh Brolin talking to Emily Blunt at the beginning of Sicario. Oh, yeah. And he says, you know, uh, like... She, she a, a terrible tragedy has happened in the opening of Sicario, and she says, "Am I gonna be able to get the people responsible?" And he says, "The people who are really responsible, you know, like mm-hmm. the people behind the people who did this." And and kind of that's similar to the pitch I think Stellan Scars has made. Rather than just like dealing with these low level folks, like you can actually attack the heart of them by stealing imperial payroll. <laughs> apparently, not clear exactly why that's important, right? I don't know what the plan is there, but. I guess it's the Imperial version of the Mission Impossible knock list. I, I don't know. I don't know what, what it is, you know? I mean, it, it also just seems like they're stealing a bunch of money. Uh, so, I, I mean, like, for instance, what seems, uh, I, imagine, I would imagine, very appealing to Cassian is that in the previous episode, he had, you know, had like, he was struggling to scrape together 700 credits to get off the planet. And now here's a job where uh, Luthen is like, if you pull this off, I will pay you 200,000. <laughs> like this is there because part of what I really like about 
what happens in this episode is that because you also have the scenes and not to skip ahead, but you have like Luthen talking to Mon Mothma and they are, you know, wealthy people from Coruscant who are funding the like the like the rebels who are doing the dirty work. But it's like this costs money. Uh, they they need like a source of income to stage a rebellion, to buy weapons and stuff like that. And so what I'm like, like my assumption here is just that they they're attacking this payroll place to just get a bunch of money to then use uh, to like expand their uh, the rebellion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. Good call. Um, so it's a classic ocean style heist, baby, is what's going on. So except with more guns and and, st- and stuff and uh you and know less, less jazz uh you know less jazzy yeah. uh they don't have a cool like soundtrack. dave holmes funk score i was gonna say playing. there's no da- a shocking lack of dave holmes in this episode but um anyway uh so the the stakes are set and uh the plot of this episode basically then splinters into three separate things there is what happens with aldani uh and what happens on the planet and then there's what happens on coruscant uh, why don't we start with the Coruscant stuff, and then we'll go to the Aldani stuff and close with that. Yeah. So, Coruscant. Is wait, it Cur- wait, wait, wait. Was it David? Are you pronouncing a hard C I in apologize. the middle? C- Coruscant? Coruscant. Apologize. Coruscant. Yeah. Apologies. Coruscant, capital of the galaxy. We David, are, did, are, are, by the way, yes. are you aware <laughs> that Coruscant is a planet, and the whole planet is a city? Hmm. Well, I, I'm the aware now. City. Yeah. Our, you can also say the whole city is one planet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that, Patrick. That's um, what I'm here for. Coruscant, capital of the galaxy. I, apo- I apologize for the hard seat. That's very uh, unnerd like of me. <laughs> Imperial Security Bureau is where we start. And we are just dropped right in into the middle of a meeting uh, in this Imperial Security Bureau. We meet a couple of characters. There's a character played by Anton Lesser. Again, uh, Maester Kyburn from... Uh, Game of Thrones, he's also played the Prime Minister in The Crown, uh, and he's kind of the guy in charge running the meeting. Uh, they're arguing about budget allocations, where they should dedicate resources. We're also not, we could not catch a name for his character. Mm-hmm. We got, I think, everyone else's names, but we couldn't catch one for him. But I he will is say, like, by the time, I, I'm just going to say, by the time next week happens, we'll probably have the name. So you don't need to like tweet or write into us. Uh, exactly. We'll probably know the name because I don't. Yeah. Want, I'm just trying to prevent 500 comments with his name. Right. Um, They'll probably officially release it in like a press release. Yeah. But yeah. he is a quintessential classic Star Wars Imperial officer. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, and one thing I really like from a screenwriting perspective, Patrick, is I'm always curious about good ways for people to give exposition. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember watching Succession, and in I think Succession episode one there was a character whose birthday it is and somebody gives a toast to that character. And so in the toast, they literally lay out that character's entire biography. I'm like, Oh, that's smart. Smart way of, you know, so Logan Roy born in blah, 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 you know, bought his first newspaper at blah, blah, blah. And it's like, Oh, okay. That's smart. Uh, Learn another one. This episode, Patrick, which is uh, have a character be displeased with the work of his underlings and then ask that person, like ask, that that person then asks the room to define the purpose of the of the meeting that they are in. <laughs> you know, he's like so unhappy. He says, "You know, yes. what is what is the purpose of this group?" And I think uh, Kira is the name of the. Her name is Dedra Miro. First name Dedra, last name Miro. Played by Denise Goff. Got it. Thank you so much for being quick on the draw with the names, Patrick. So. Uh, at that point, Deirdre Miro explains what the purpose of this whole charade is. Uh, she says, quote, we're here to further security objectives by connecting intelligence, providing useful analysis, and conducting effective covert actions, end quote. So now we now we know what the her purpose of that governing body is. Which which then her boss points out is she's just quoting verbatim from like their like like rule book or whatever. Which honestly, this this move and also her really over eager desire to like impress her bosses and like you know really jump on like uh, potential new cases. Um, I feel like she and Cyril Karn are just made for each other mm-hmm. i hope i hope we get a beautiful love story yes. developing out of these two little like suck up fascists yes i'm shipping these two i'm shipping these two exactly but anyway, but anyway uh he 
at that point, Edton Lester's character says uh, security is an illusion. They're there to identify germs, identify symptoms, locating germs. So we're, he's like, we're healthcare for right. the galaxy. I, I think, and what he's trying to say is that we're not just solving the symptoms. Like we're trying to identify the root causes and like stomp them out before they become a problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, before so, they become, become a virus. Yes, yes. The Ferrick situation comes up. And it's it's fascinating that I think this is the first time we hear about the Ferrick situation after the last episode. It's not we're not like following Karn. We're following like his superiors at this point. Like mm -hmm. you're hearing about what the meeting about the Ferrick situation would be after Ferrix and not like I just think it's an interesting choice to not follow Karn because like that's kind of who we are with for a lot of last. Right. Episodes. Well, because I think one of the interesting things about the first three episodes is that we're so used to just being at like, oh yeah, the Empire. The Empire is everywhere. They were they were all over, all over the bad guys are the Empire, and then we're introduced to oh no, this is like an independent uh, security company that is contracted by the Empire. Yeah. And uh, the like the the was it uh. Preox and are the then the I, I was looking through like the Wikipedia stuff and uh because like th the Premore thing is specifically for the Morlana system mm -hmm. and but I believe like Preox is the actual like o like main security company but yeah but like we we were dealing entirely with them and uh and them handling the issue and then clearly uh Karn screwed things up so much that now the the actual like the higher up imperial branch is having to deal with what happened there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do get a scene with Karn though. Like I, I wasn't trying to imply that we didn't follow Karn at all, but it just is interesting. Oh, we, we, we it was interesting. That wasn't the Karn. first thing we saw. Like we saw like kind of the impact of it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we see Blevins uh, chewing out Karn and his superiors, and it is very satisfying because you want a very satisfying scene of this guy getting reamed out after his terrible mistakes from last episode. And I think this one delivers. He kind of is explaining to them, here's all the stuff you're going to do. You're going to sign off on this report. You're not even going to read it. You're going to hand over all your computers and your iPads and your iPhones. And then you're going to GTFO. You know, you're going to, you're going to get out of here. And not only that, Karn, you messed up the job so badly that there's not even going to replacement be a replacement for you because we're basically eliminating this whole position because we don't trust you people to do it anymore. Yeah. Um, that's the how bad is taking over that whole system now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, what, what, did you have any thoughts on that? Like I, my favorite part bit is when his boss is like, wait, I didn't even do anything. And he's like, that's exactly right. You didn't, yep. you know, that's the problem. You should stop this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I liked it when, uh, Linus was his name, right? Uh, yes. Uh, I like it when he raises his hand to talk. <laughs> It's like nice. Uh, it's nice little like, goofy moments. Like it was. A, it was kind of a surprising, kind of goofy moment in the episode. But anyway. Yeah. All right, and then like later on, we see Karn traveling to go home, and his mom is there, and she is both ashamed of him but happy to see him. I mean, I the guess... move of she opens the door, she slaps him in the face, and yeah. then hugs him. Yeah. And you. you anyway, uh, look, Karn, terrible person, awful to work with. But I think the show is clearly trying to make you sympathize with him by, like, introducing you to his mom, you know? Um, I mean, he is, like we said in, on our, our previous episode, he's pathetic. Uh, <laughs> like, I would not want to ever be around this guy, but he is a, a, he is a pathetic figure mm -hmm. who's, you know, who, as we saw in the last episodes, it, was just grasping at, like, any, any, anything to make him self feel powerful because he's clearly not a powerful person and one thing i really liked about this just watching him like lugging his suitcases home on coruscant is just that like in the in the prequels we saw a lot of coruscant mm -hmm. uh we saw more of coruscant than any other planet but what we always saw of coruscant was uh Padme Amidala's like royal chambers are the Senate are the Jedi temple. We were always in like, like the height of luxury and government. And uh, I, I, I guess, except for when Obi-Wan and Anakin go to that bar uh, in, in, in uh, when they're chasing uh, the assassin in the beginning of episode two. But, uh, but it's like, Again, as someone who just likes to to see this this whole giant world built out, I really enjoyed seeing like what regular people's apartments are like uh, on Coruscant, and like 
just what these like you know how they get home what these like big complexes are life at, are, are are like and especially this is great because it's contrasting with when we see all the stuff with Luthen and Mon Mothma who are the elites of Coruscant yeah yeah uh well why don't we we get to that in a bit very shortly but first just a couple of other scenes to tie things up at, at Coruscant um basically David, David you said the hard say of course, I apologize. I don't know what's I don't know what's wrong with me. I think I feel like I've said Coruscant before in the past, and like I, maybe I'm just pretty to, sure you have. You've talked about Star Wars. It's just it's just because I'm now uh, talking with the heavy hitter Patrick Willems, and it's making me so nervous. You know, look, I'm just here because you know how Star Wars fans can be, and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm just trying to protect you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So we get some more conversation with. Uh, d- the Deirdre Mir- Miro character? Deirdre. Deirdre, Deirdre Miro. Miro? I, you know, I could have sworn, by the way, let, let me, yeah, okay. Let's, let's, yes, Deirdre Miro. Um, we learned that five people died at the Ferrex accident. One local, who's Tim, RIP Tim, and four pre-more security. Uh, and I, uh, I'm kind of curious, like, we didn't see any Bix this episode, so I'm curious. Like, are we gonna ever see what happens to Bix, or was like that that her whole storyline is like she was in love with this guy named Tim, and then he died? Um, but uh, anyway, Miro is really uh, trying to get back this Imperial Starpath unit. Like, it's clear that this is a very important piece of technology, and uh, she it was stolen, I think, from a sector that she's responsible for. Right. As in like a while ago. Uh, yeah. But it was like, but now they're able to trace it to be like, oh, this thing we found, this was a thing that we had like discovered was stolen, like, you know, a, a while. Because like it's implied, uh, like Cassian does imply in the first three episodes that he's had been holding on to this for a while because he knows it's valuable. Yeah. Yeah. And the problem is, Patrick, that the Starpath unit was recovered. As part of the Ferrex incident, which is not a sector that sh- that she's responsible for, so she has to go to Blevins and basically be like, "I want to see the report," and he's like, "F off!" Like I'm, I run my own sectors the way I want to do it, and you don't get to look at my reports. And she eventually brings it to their superior, and she loses the argument with Anton Lessa's character, uh, who is basically like, "Look, we don't need this. Is you're you're barking up the wrong tree here. There's there's nothing to see here." And she's like, "I actually think there might be a rebellion forming." And I think she's basically dismissed, right? Yes. And the irony is that she's right. Mm-hmm. Like, even though she is a villain, <laughs> uh, she is right about this and just gets shot down. But, but, but again, the, the boss shooting her down is the same kind of overconfidence that uh, that Cassian was talking about in his first scene with Luthen. Right. And um, they just don't, they, they think that they are like impenetrable. And uh, even though she's presenting genuine, like real evidence of like, hey, there's been this like record of these certain things being stolen, that they there are connections there. And this is probably something that we should look into. And he's just like, no, that's like, uh, that's stupid stuff, not an issue. Uh, there's no way, like that's not real evidence. Stop doing this. Yeah, and... I think it's just interesting that the show is again putting you in their perspective because I think we are meant to kind of root for, you know, quote unquote, root for uh, Dedra, right? Like we we want her to be seen as knowledgeable and factually correct by her superiors, um, but at the same time we also root against the Empire. So it's like it's it's interesting, you know, how it's putting you. I guess I'm cu- I'm gonna get be curious what the show has to say about these mid level people working as part of the Empire in um by the by the show's end like what what does the show saying about these characters right i think right. that i think that rogue one clearly had a perspective on people like krennic right which is that um your your boss is going to take credit for your accomplishments and also it's they're just going to literally straight up murder you uh once you become not useful to them yeah so i'm curious like if this show will have a similar theme yeah and it's also interesting because i think other than krennic uh, in terms of like again, live action Star Wars, uh, we don't tend to get storylines from the perspectives of Imperial people. Uh, I mean, like the the, the Obi Wan Kenobi show, uh, you know, did have uh, devote a lot of time to uh, the character of Reva, uh, who was one of the um, 
what was it the like oh you didn't watch the show uh one of the like uh inquisitors uh was that it um but i uh, uh, who who is a villain but then of course they reveal later on the show spoilers for obi-wan kenobi that she is actually kind of like infiltrating mm-hmm. the empire t- so to get uh like to eventually get revenge um and so so yeah like w- we don't tend to like we never tend to see things from the perspective of just people in the empire who actually care about the empire and uh and are are essentially villains and so and it, it it is this interesting thing where like you know because fic- in, in fiction we are like like we are predisposed to uh empathize with like these pov characters especially like ones who are getting shot down by their bosses and stuff like that but these are also characters who are actively working against our protagonists like if i uh, if dedra has her way uh she will basically just you know, be able to capture and then execute Cassie and Andor, the star of the show. So, but also, you know, she's an interesting character, and you know, kind of, kind of like uh, Cyril Karn, she is a really pasty-looking, pale person who <laughs> looks like she has not gotten enough sleep. Uh, probably been up late studying reports. They are, I've got to say, they've been really good at casting uh the, the these various uh like mid-level imperial officers yeah and i'm curious like whether either of these characters will become part of the rebellion you know maybe, maybe cyril karn or or deirdre will be will become part of the rebellion we have no idea well well you know what we know for sure what you know who's not gonna join the rebellion <laughs> blevins blevins because look folks I checked Wikipedia this morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, Blevins apparent, uh, was originally introduced in uh, Chuck Wendig's Aftermath novels, which are, are, I believe, set in the aftermath of the Battle of Endor um, from Return of the Jedi. And uh, Blevins died on Endor. So you know what? And he, and he was still an Imperial officer when that happened. So sorry, <laughs> but uh, Blevins... Damn, is- I, was really, I was really putting all my chips behind Blevins as the person who might turn, so... I know. Yeah. yeah. Maybe in the sequel sequel trilogy, old man Blevins was gonna, you know, <laughs> become the become the new chancellor of yeah. the new new republic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, well, we've been horribly spoiled, but thank you for that's good information. It's nothing that we shouldn't have already known, right? If we watch Star Star Wars. So Exactly. Okay. Let's move on. Uh the only other thing about Coruscant really that's worth pointing out is all these scenes with Mon Mothma. We are introduced to Mon Mothma, which is a big deal, right? Mon Mothma's character in Star Wars history, she has previously been portrayed by Caroline Bankston in Return of the Jedi, but in Rogue One and in Andor, she is portrayed by the actor Genevieve O'Reilly. And uh, and it, this is, I know Genevieve O'Reilly has talked about this in interviews, but it is really wild how Mon Mothma, basically there in Return of the Jedi to say one legendary line about yes. how many Bothans died to... Give us this information. Yes. And then Genevieve O'Reilly, in her 20s, gets cast as basically like a one-scene cameo in Revenge of the Sith so that we can all, like, sit up and point at the screen and go like, oh, look, it's Mon Mothma, but she's young. And then that's it. And then it was cool when she gets brought back in yeah, Rogue like, One. For like th- three or four scenes in Rogue One. Yeah, it's like, oh, cool, continuity, yeah. Right, but it's still like in, in those scenes, Genevieve O'Reilly... Is still not like playing a real character. She is there to basically stand there, and because Mon Mothma's only characterization ever, based on that tiny scene in Return of the Jedi, was oh, she is a stoic leader, and then in Rogue One, she is again a stoic leader who delivers exposition uh, and like gives people their missions, and it is. To me, at least to me, very interesting to suddenly, like, immediately see her as a real character who has real concerns, who has a personal life, who has a husband who is planning a dinner party uh, that she forgot was happening and inviting over people she doesn't like, that she, like her coworkers. Also, one little uh, kind of I don't want to say Easter egg, um, but I, I'm sorry, I'm looking up my notes here. Uh, when she's looking at the seating chart for uh for the the dinner party one of the people that she mentions who's coming is sly moore sly moore uh is a character 
uh, is a character who I, th- I believe has zero lines, but does appear in Revenge of the Sith. Uh, who is, she's basically this uh, creepy bald woman who has a really high collared like dress. Um, and interestingly is, uh, was it she, 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 she stood, um, she, this is a quote from Wikipedia. She stood at the chancellor and we're talking chancellor Palpatine. She stood at the chancellor's side along with vice chair Masamada on the day that he ended the clone wars and anointed himself emperor of the first galactic empire. And she was one of the few people who knew that he was that, that, uh, Palpatine is actually a Sith Lord. So she is a bad guy and yet is getting invited to Mon Mothma and her husband's dinner party. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great, great call and reference. Uh, and I think that it isn't surprising to me that there are evil people in the Empire Senate because Mon Mothma is a senator and she needs to work with these people, right? Yeah. Um, so... It wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if there's people who want to spread misery throughout the rest of the galaxy. Uh, it, certainly it's true of the United States Senate, so I, I, it has to be true in the Empire Senate, Senate, which is explicitly evil. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, have you seen have you seen the way Palpatine looks? Uh, that, guy, that, that guy can't be a good guy. Yeah. Look yeah. at him. Uh, he, he looks like a monster. <laughs> uh, well, I think you already brought up most of the su- significant points around Mon Mothma's plotline. Yeah, she, uh, well, we should say she meets with Luthen, right? Who and we, who, we find who, out what ha- Luthen's like day job is, right? Which is he is, I guess, an artifact dealer. Is my sense well, right? I feel like he runs an antique store, basically, mm-hmm. but like a very high end antique yeah, store. Yeah. Like there's like a, there's a fun little part when uh he's talking to Mon Mothma in the back where he's like, let me show you some like great items that you might want to get your husband for a present. And, uh, and then her driver, uh, also she has a really cool like flying car that she rides around yeah. in. And her driver is talking to like the, uh, the other employee at the store. And she's like, would you like to see anything? He's like, I can't afford anything here. <laughs> no. Uh, again, just nice little moments uh, that, that feel like very human in, in this, this world. And uh, well, but we, yeah, like, we we should also bring up that before he meets Mon Mothma, Luthen uh, dresses up with a wig and a clothing, purple clothes, and all this different stuff, and kind of like I think he does like a gesture where he's like pretending to imitate the mannerisms of who he will be, uh, yes. you know, when he's talking to Mon Mothma. And it reminds me of this scene in The Prestige, where uh, Hugh Jackman and Christian Bale's character in The Prestige are. Uh, magicians and they both observe this older i think he's an asian gentleman yes doing a trick where he like makes a fishbowl appear on uh, on stage out of nowhere and then they observe the old man walking into his carriage at the end and christian bell's like this is the performance this is the performance right he's like it's not what we saw on stage it's him pretending to be old and infirm right Mm -hmm. and I guess I was just reminded of that in that the scene where we see Stellan Skarsgård kind of prepare to be this antique dealer. Cause it's like, that's his, and it's like, how long has he been this guy? Probably many, many years because it seems like this store is very old. And so he's, this is the, he has been this guy for years, if not decades, but who we see him talking with Andor, I think that's who he really is. Right. Yes. Uh, it definitely, oh, uh, this is to me what's interesting because you might think that when he is doing his like his shady dealings where he's, you know, uh, like illegally like funding rebels and hiring mercenaries and stuff like that, like maybe for that stuff, he would like put on a wig and change his identity. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But no, that's like really him. Yeah. And then everything else that he does when he's like at home presumably on, yeah. on Coruscant, d- probably doing the majority of his life. That's all a performance where he's playing a character because he, he also like, again, whenever he's talking to Cassian, he's talking like this and he's talking <laughs> about getting those bastards. And, uh, and, 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 and also I, I know he's Swedish, but uh, when he says bastards, I'm, I'm just like, he sounds like vaguely Irish there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but like, that's really him. But then, uh, he's so friendly and always smiling when yeah. he's on Coruscant. But yeah, he and Mon Mothma are talking about how it's just like getting way harder to just get money. Yeah. Uh, and like 
how there's like new people at the bank all the times. And so it's hard to like make big withdrawals to fund this like off the book stuff and how there's spies everywhere. And it's just, uh, and yeah, you just uh, like, you really get a sense of, of like the paranoia that must exist there because I mean, like I'm, I'm presuming that uh, Mon Mothma knows Bail Organa at this point because mm-hmm. he's obviously still a senator and involved in this stuff. But um, and, and I think there we assume that at some we assume that at some point Mon Mothma stops becoming a senator and becomes a leader in the Rebel Alliance, right? Like, and that that that's the case by the time that Rogue One occurs. Is that your interpretation? I don't, I don't think know. She, I don't think she's still a senator at the time of Rogue One. Maybe she is. I'm not I sure. I mean, about. is Bail Organa still a senator at that point? Mm. Does he mention, you know what? I'm going to check uh, Bail Organa's timeline on Wikipedia. All right. All right. This is what people li- listen to the show for, yes, right? Yes. No, t- totally. Totally. So anyway, uh, I, I kind of love this idea of Stellan Skarsgård's character, Luthen, kind of putting on different faces, you know, for different situations. And, and you kind of wonder how long he's been doing uh, this performance. So, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's all interesting stuff. And, um, and also just, you know, Coruscant is a cool looking place. <laughs> and, um, I just, I just like seeing court. Like, again, it is, um, you know, we've mostly been talking about like, you know, plot and character stuff, but, uh, just like in terms of like the visuals of the show, cause you know, Star Wars tends to be a, like tends to look good. Um, I, I always like, I enjoy these times when we revisit Coruscant um, in in things other than the prequel movies and mm-hmm. just get to see like a, a, a different visual approach to the same location uh, where every, you know, it, it doesn't quite have that like that look that it did uh, in, in the prequels, the like, there are no sets. Everything is shot on a green screen uh, and looks kind of plasticky. It's like Coruscant looks a bit more tangible a bit more natural here uh, than it did in those movies. And, you know, I, uh, like, I, I love this. I mean, I'm just going to say, uh, actually, here's the thing that I want to point out. Um, uh, I, I only realized today that the costume designer on Andor is Michael Wilkinson, um, who uh, I'm currently in my other job, the thing I spend most of my time doing, Wait, you Make don't spend it, most of your time on this podcast, Patrick? This is, believe it or not. This is not um, what we agreed on. <laughs> I, I don't spend 60 hours a week uh, recording this podcast. Wow. It, it, you, have altered actually, the ter- you have altered the terms of the deal. I should pray you not alter it further. See, this is what <laughs> listeners don't know. We actually record 60 hours of content uh, per week, and yeah. we, then we just cut it down to the, the, the best bits. Yeah, this is what you're listening to. This is the edited down version of the 60-hour conversation we have, which exactly. you, people might be listening being like, wow, they really left a lot of flab in this. And it's like, trust me, guys, you haven't heard the, un, the, the raw uncut one. Oh so. yeah, it, it's just us making sounds, like forgetting how to speak. <laughs> yeah. No, what I was going to say is, uh, my my day job, I guess, is making uh, video essays about movies on the internet, and I'm currently working on a uh, a large, challenging project about the filmography of Zack Snyder, and um, and Michael Wilkinson is really best known for being the costume designer on pretty much every Zack Snyder film. Uh, he's been working mostly in like the 2000s, but he's this is the guy who's you know, best known for like making the loincloths and capes in 300 the and all the superhero costumes in like Watchmen and, you know, uh, Batman v Superman and Justice League and, and stuff like that. And uh, this is his first Star Wars project. And I got to say, I know we were talking about Cassian's coats uh, in the previous episode, but I think he's crushing it with the costumes. And we get like Mon Mothma has just cool like yeah. you know high collared like rich person garb on on coruscant but like all like you know i love the look of the, all the pre-more guards or, or pre-more officers and stuff like that and again the, the thing with star wars even when i'm like frustrated by like other shows and stuff like that like the the craft like the the design of things they they never drop the ball there it is mm-hmm. like the highest level possible agreed agreed all right, well, that's most of what happens with the Mon Mothma storyline. That's Coruscant storyline. Uh, so let's move on. But before we do that, Patrick Willems, if people are enjoying hearing our conversation, where should people find more of your work on the internet? Uh, you can watch those videos that I just mentioned a second ago at youtube.com slash Patrick H. Willems. And I'm on social media platforms at Patrick H. Willems. 
And if you're enjoying this conversation, uh, you can support this podcast by going to decodingtv.com and becoming a paid member. Uh, also, we have another podcast about House of the Dragon specifically. Check it out at a castofkings.com. I think uh, if you're enjoying this conversation about Andor and you like House of the Dragon, you'll like a cast of kings. Um, so and a big thanks to everyone at decodingtv.com who's supporting us and making this podcast possible. Uh, this is a comment that came in on YouTube. And I wanted to mention at the beginning, but now I'm putting it in the middle instead of the episode. Uh, but the Moke is Mbembe writes in, quote, the BBY 5 in Andor Episode 1, before the Battle of Yavin 5, is a great example of how there are fan service bits in the show, but they are unobtrusive. The BBY-ABY system goes back to an early licensed Star Wars encyclopedia from the early 90s and has been used in expanded universe media ever since. I think it was originally justified out of universe because it centers time on the original film, but I think over time it became to have uh, came to have an in universe explanation too. It certainly makes the uh, empire its rise and fall feel singular in recent galactic history, which is one of the reasons I thought the direction they chose with uh, the first order in the Force Awakens was pretty bad. There are actually tons of little references in the show to previous Star Wars media, ships from previous shows and movies, tech and vehicle mentions pulled from the 80s and 90s tabletop RPG. Cassian's pistol is the same kind the character starts with in the 90s LucasArts shooter Dark Forces, also about stealing Death Star plants. These things work, through, work though, because they're not dwelt upon or pointed out. They're just used as dressing to make the world feel rich. I thought that was a great summary of why I think Patrick and I are loving this show. There's tons of little references. It's a rich history they're drawing from, but they're not like, "Hey, look, it's the it's the blaster, it's the jacket that the guy wore." Remember, and the you know the music swells and everything goes out of focus except for the jacket. And you know, it's like it's just like, "Hey, this is all just stuff it's, part of the world." You know, it's not about the references. Yes, yes, totally. Okay, so there is a whole other plotline that happens on Aldani. Uh, the you know Luthen and. Cassian land and there's this negotiation about what's going to happen. He's got five days and he needs a new name during that time. Um, he also gives us this, this, he gives him this thing called the Kowati Signet, uh, which celebrates the uprising against the Rakatan invaders, I think. Uh, and I guess the idea is that this is a valuable thing that you can potentially trade if you need to, if you end up in a bad situation. That was my I mean, interpretation. It's a piece of blue Kyber. Uh, yeah. And as we all know, you know, Kyber is what they make, is what powers lightsabers. It's, yeah. uh, it's and also that, uh, the Death Star from that. I was about to say, it's, it's yeah. stuff that, that they're mining from Jeddah uh, to power the super laser on the Death Star. So he says to Vel, hey, I'm paying this guy to help you guys out. He's going to be like a critical redundancy for you because you guys are a pretty small team and pretty scrappy right now. Uh, they've been pre prepping this mission for five months. And here you have a guy coming in last minute, three days left, or I, it says, he says five days, but I think it takes some time to travel there. It takes them like a day to travel there. So they really only have three days. Yeah. Um, As the kids would say, that sounds a little sus. <laughs> well, it's just also like in any heist movie, there's usually like with heat, you know, the the guy who comes in the last minute is always the wild card. He's always like this person who you can't predict. Like you could Although imagine the story being told from... Vel's perspective or the guy's perspective on the Wait, planet? So Go ahead. Are you saying that Cassian is the Wayne Grow? Oh, 100%. 100%. Without, with a little bit less of the misogyny, I think. I, um, yeah, except, except also probably not a, a monster who's just going to yes. murder everyone he encounters. Uh, Although I, you, never, you never know. That's the point. You don't know. But yes. Also, the show began with him murdering people. Yes, so. 100%. Thank you. Okay, Cassian you. is Wayne Grow. Here we go. Oh, uh, I mean, Luthen, when he describes him, he's like, yeah, he can. He knows like all these languages. He can pilot a ship, and he's not afraid to kill. It's like, okay, like, um, not sure this is really going to work out. So anyway, whatever. Vel agrees to it. I think because my sense is like Vel knows she's in a tough spot. Like this is a very difficult mission, and she knows she needs as many people as possible. Yes. Um, but. Yeah, uh, and, and I guess they're really putting a lot of emphasis on like Andor's skills as jack of all trades, right? Because otherwise, like, why is why would he be useful to this thing? But he can pilot, he can kill, he can do all kinds of things. Uh, they have lots of conversations when they're walking back to the camp. The the vistas and the landscapes are just incredibly beautiful. It looks like the Scottish Highlands, basically. I don't know where they're filming this thing. Yeah, I know. I, I know they filmed a lot of the show in the UK. Yeah. Uh, but this, I was like, I don't know. Is this Iceland? Is this, is this Scotland? Uh, 
but it it looks incredible. They yeah. like it, and and also and I I will say a thing that I I know I know we all complained about the thing where J.J. Abrams when he would make both Star Wars and Star Trek stuff uh, only seemed to want to show spaceships inside atmospheres and not like in space. Mm-hmm. Um, but like watching those TIE fighters like come like roaring yeah. over like the highlands does look really cool. Yeah, I agree. I agree. While they are walking back, we learn a lot about what this mission is and what the makeup is and what the situation is. Bell says they have seven people taking on an Imperial army. Uh, Cassian's like, this is a suicide. This is right. not going well at all. And it's a, it's a garrison with like, yes. what is it? Is, are there like 40 people who, uh, who work there? I think so. Yeah. It's definitely yeah. way more than they have. And also the other, the rest of the crew doesn't know that Vel is being helped by Luthen. So he's like, we're not talking about that guy. Who? Which guy? Who? I don't know. You know? And I, uh, I imagine it's good for Luthen to uh to have as few people as possible see his face. Yeah. Yeah. Uh but yeah, you can imagine that if you're part of the crew that Val's been building up for five months, they've been sleeping on rocks, and this guy comes in at the end, three days before the end, you would feel pretty suspicious about that. You know, yeah. what's going on? Um and and I am kind of curious, like if we're gonna learn more about the circumstances under which this pairing occurred because like what was Luthen's whole plan he's like I I don't think these guys have enough people so I, I've got the perfect person and he gets Cassian and needs to convince him to come uh, through this very complex plot where he tries to buy this Imperial Starpath unit as well you know uh, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious what the whole the overarching plan was you know right like, like he went to some trouble to get Cassian <laughs> yeah and now he's dropping him off on a very dangerous mission and uh where he what could if die. said no? Like, what, would they have? Just, you know, like anyway. I'm, right. I'm, I, but but he seems to he, he has a lot of plans, and so and we don't know about a lot of them. So I'm sure he, like, look, if, if he knows all the stuff about Cassian and he picked him for this, he I'm sure he has his reasons. A couple of minor touches to point out. I, I like when Cassian's on the ship, and Luthen and Val are talking, and he's like thinking maybe I should just take off with this ship. Um, and then the robot like looks at him and is like, may I help you, sir? Like, I noticed you're trying to steal the ship. Uh, so that was funny. There's also a little bit of information about who the Aldanis are. There were like 40,000 of them living here. And we get another sense of how uh, the Empire has displaced a lot of people or, uh, you know, th th there is a cost to the Empire's rule and it's borne by innocent people. Um, they used to like kind of live and inhabit this region and they've been pushed south basically. Yeah. And so, now the empire is basically using this as like a, a shipping hub. Yeah. We meet the crew, uh, which consists of Skeet, Nemec, Tamar, Taramin, and Sinta and Lieutenant Gorn, right? Yeah. These are the people we meet. Lieutenant Gorn, who is their contact at yes. the garrison, like an Imperial guy who's actually working with the rebels. Like a defector. And, I yeah. Think, right? yeah. And he's, uh, yeah, he's their inside. You, you got to have an inside man for a heist. Yeah. Uh, and he's the one who shows up a bit later. Yeah. And w this is, it's an interesting cast. I recognized two of them. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's that guy from the bear, right? You yeah. The bear? Um, yeah. I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Uh, Eben Moss Backrack. Yeah. Uh, who, who's having a great year because he's in the bear. He was uh, the journalist in The Dropout, uh, mm. who writes the story that like exposes uh, Elizabeth Holmes. Um, and then, then there's Alex Lothar as Nemec and he, uh, he was the kid, he was the star of, um, uh, oh yeah, we can't swear on this. The end of the effing world, that, mm -hmm. that show on Netflix. And he's in that one episode of Black Mirror. Hmm. Yeah. And, uh, the other ones I'm less familiar with. So I don't know that there's that much to dive into here. There's there's a couple of interesting things like uh, Andor has a blaster burn, which I think I don't know if that's the first time we've seen a blaster burn like need to be treated in the way that it is on the show, but mm -hmm. maybe it's one of the first time. But it's just it's just interesting because we don't we see blasters kill people, but we don't see like oh yeah, there's a recovery period from getting hit by a blaster. That's kind of interesting. Right. Oh, right? it grazed your arm. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. It's, uh, I mean, you know, instead of tearing a chunk of flesh out, it just, uh, a really, really hot thing hit your skin. Yeah. But overall, everyone's just really unhappy that Andor's being brought in. And I love all these scenes where Vel needs to kind of 
sell the lie. Like it was always part of the plan. We didn't know if it happened. And, and you get to see her like convince all these, try to convince these people that she has everything under control. And it's really great to see because it's very tense. Every single one of these conversations is very tense. Yeah. Uh, often in different ways. It, it did feel a little bit repetitive because it's just basically you're seeing consecutive people being unhappy with the situation. But overall, uh, I really liked what we got to see from Vel in this series of scenes. Yeah. And, and also during these scenes, while there's like, you know, everyone kind of being unhappy, we also do get a sense of like seeing more of the plan as like Cassian is being given this uh, like tablet that, that that does have like diagrams of like, you know, the uh, like vehicles they'll be using and stuff like that. It seemed like a uh, like an iPad specifically designed for heists. It's like this has uh, That's all I want. how to drive the vehicle, uh, the plans for the thing. And here's a common catchphrases that you need to learn, you know, and it's like, and by the way, you have six hours to learn this. Uh, right. But I, I love that. Like, here's like Andari phrases that you yeah. need to learn. Yeah. And like the rare time in Star Wars, they actually get into different languages existing here. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I am kind of curious, like, what are the consequences if Andor doesn't learn all this stuff? Because that's a lot of stuff to learn, you know? Yeah, and thankfully, uh, usually whenever they ask him, like, can, like, can you fly this yeah. or drive this or do this? Thankfully, he's uh, he's able to do all this stuff. So, Or at least he's able to convince them that he knows how to do it, you know? He, says, he seems pretty confident, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but I do get the sense that Andor's life is in danger, you know? If he is unable to perform or he doesn't do the thing he's supposed to, uh, Luthen has said... We're renting him, and we can just uh, get rid of him if we. He's uh, disposable. He's disposable, as he says. So yeah. if he doesn't do the job, Andor is pretty screwed. Also, this is um, I, th in in, a, in an early dialogue scene with uh, Skeet and Nemec, uh, we got our first mention of Saw Gerrera, mm, Morris Whitaker's yes. character from Rogue One, who we know is appearing in the show. Yeah, so we'll see how that comes into play. Only other thing I want to bring up is they obviously do this thing where. They go through what the heist is going to be like. Uh, one of the characters my, apologizes. My, my, my favorite yeah. thing. It's awesome. It's awesome. I mean, but like, I mean, I have like, I have a, such a soft spot for heist stories in fiction. But Same. Same. when you have a scene where the people are going through the plan for the heist using small, like mo scale models of of the place and like the vehicles, that is my favorite thing. And watching Nemec, you know. Like moving the models around, doesn't he say like like it's not to scale? Yeah, one of the characters says it's not to scale. I'm like, this is a Back to the Future reference for sure. I think. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. I, I I love that. Like yeah. it's it's the same thing when people are like planning car like car heists and they're moving like like Matchbox cars around uh, to like like I just it's a visual that I always think is awesome and I'm very happy to see. It. Like we're used to Star Wars where it's like, oh, we have a, a super advanced hologram that will show us like a 3D layout of everything. <laughs> and yeah. like here watching people like show just like I don't know, little like wooden models they made of what they're doing, it's so different from what we're used to here yeah. and I love it. I agree. They describe this thing called the eye that is a once every 3 years meteorological phenomenon it's like a meteor shower kind of yeah thing. 50 meteor showers at once is how it's described and the idea is cassian is asking how are we going to get out of this alive because there's so many people we're going to be under attack and it's like well it just so happens that we've timed this heist with this meteorological phenomenon uh that's going to distract everyone and for like, i think a period of like three minutes or something like that mm -hmm. so they'll have like several minutes uh to get this thing out and I gotta say, I'm really looking forward to seeing this heist because um, last time I think I saw a Star Wars heist was in Solo a Star Wars Story, and that was like the best part of that movie. I thought the train heist. Oh, uh, oh the train heist, yes. I was, yeah. I was gonna say, like, I, I think I, that was a lot better than the Kessel heist, which is the Correct. majority of the movie. But yeah, right. train heist was great. Yeah, so I'm really psyched about this and hoping they have some nice visual effects to show us about this, uh, the eye, which is gonna form over the horizon. So I know. I can't wait to see it. And then the episode does just kind of end kind of in the way that like episode one and I think two just kind of ended. Yep. It just feels like we're mid thought, but you know, yep. Indeed. All right. Well, looking forward to seeing what happens with the heist. I really hope we get to it in the next episode. A and, and I'm also looking forward to the dinner party. <laughs> I All hope right. that, I hope we get them dramatically intercutting like 
uh, a car chase with gen- then just like a tense discussion about politics around mm-hmm. Mon Mothma's table. Mm-hmm. With uh, in- intoning gravely about the state of the galaxy, you know. Exactly. Um, and these, you know, something like these rebels are all, um, uh, they're, they're, they're so scattered and unorganized and, uh, and they don't know what they're doing. They couldn't possibly pierce our imperial defenses. Meanwhile, that is voiceover over like them doing exactly what they said they can't do. Man, why I'm calling, they... I'm calling my shot like Babe Ruth, Patrick. David, Holmes. why didn't they hire us to write Andor? I, uh, extremely great question. Extremely hey, great question. Kathleen Kennedy, I'm sure you listen to this show <laughs> Be- because you have nothing better to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're available for Andor yes. season two. hundred percent. Yeah. If, if you, if you need to staff the writers, if like, I don't know if, if I, you know, the, if, if you're not satisfied with, with having the writer of Nightcrawler on, on your staff, bring in us. Mm-hmm. We can do it. Agreed. Agreed. All right. I think that's going to bring us into this week's episode of Decoding TV. We hope you've enjoyed our conversation about Andor season one, episode four. We'll be back next week with another recap of Andor season one, episode five. He is Patrick Willems. I am David Chen. We'll see you later. Bye. And may the force be with you. Hey, everyone. David Chen here. Thank you so much for watching that video from Decoding TV. If you want to get an audio version of the show, all you got to do is go to podcast.decodingtv.com. And if you want to support what we do, get ad-free episodes of the podcast and also bonus episodes of the podcast, go to decodingtv.com and become a paid member. Of course, you can also like and subscribe for more. We appreciate it. Thanks. See you later.